Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks. So the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics was just announced, and this year it was actually split into two. The first half was given to Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland for their method of generating high-intensity ultra-short optical pulses, and the second half was given to Arthur Ashkin for developing what are called optical tweezers. Today we want to focus on the second parts of the prize and figure out what exactly are optical tweezers. Well, it may sound a bit sensationalist, but they're basically Star Trek tractor beams made of light, but for very small objects. But that's still super cool. They allow you to take very small objects like DNA molecules or proteins, grab them, move them wherever you want, place them how you want, using nothing but light. But how do they work? Well, to understand that, first we have to understand something very important. That light has momentum. Now, if you've ever taken a physics class, you might find that seemingly impossible. You may have learned that momentum is equal to the mass of an object times its velocity. And you also learned that light has no mass, ergo seemingly no momentum. Well, I'm actually going to save exploring that topic more completely for a later video. So for now, let's just operate under the assumption that it is true, that light has momentum, and see where that leads us. And if you want to know more, well, I guess stay tuned to the channel. Now to start off, let's actually ignore light completely and think of a more familiar situation. Let's imagine I have a ball and a box and I throw the ball at the box. Schematically, we can break the situation down like this. Initially, the box has no momentum because we assume it's just sitting there still and the ball has some initial momentum that I give it. Let's also assume I'm throwing the ball to the right. It then hits the box and ricochets or bounces back in the direction it came. When it hits the box, the box is also set into the motion. So afterwards, the ball has a new momentum and now the box, which initially had no momentum, has momentum too. Now, in any closed system, the total momentum is conserved. So this means that the initial momentum for the whole system must equal the total final momentum. Now let's take things to an extreme. In fact, let's take them to a technically impossible extreme and imagine that after a perfect rebound, the ball is the same speed it started with, but just heading in the opposite direction, to the left. So the ball's initial and final speed are the same. You then might want to say that that means that the ball's initial and final momentum are the same. However, we can see that if that were the case, the only way momentum could be conserved and the initial and final ball have the same momentum is if the box never got any momentum at all from being hit by the ball. Which, as anyone who's ever thrown a ball at another thing knows, that's not how that works. The issue here is that momentum is a vector. It doesn't just matter what your mass and speed are, but also the direction you're going in. After the collision, the ball is moving in the opposite direction, so its final momentum is the negative of its starting. Same amounts, opposite direction. So with that in mind, we see that in such a perfect rebound where the ball leaves with the same speed, but in the opposite direction, the box receives twice the initial momentum of the ball. And this makes sense. The box had to first exert a force on the ball to bring the speed of the ball from whatever it started at to zero, then even more force to take its speed from zero back to its starting speed, but in the other direction. Well, with Newton's third law, when the box is pushing on the ball, the ball is pushing on the box. Now I should point out that such perfect reflections aren't actually possible. They conserve momentum because momentum can be negative, but they don't conserve energy, which isn't a vector. So in reality, the ball must lose some small amount of speed in any rebound. However, if the box is very, very heavy relative to the initial momentum of the ball, then this change is going to be very small, and we can get away with ignoring it. If that's confusing, it's, it's, it's not that important. In fact, the only big key takeaway from this whole discussion is this. If my ball perfectly rebounds off a box, even though its speed may change negligibly, if its direction is changing, then it is still imparting momentum to the thing it's rebounding off of. In other words, it is exerting a force, or pushing it by bouncing. Okay, so that's maybe a little dry, but we can consider that like eating our vegetables. And now we're ready for the dessert, understanding how optical tweezers work. Let's start by imagining a beam of light reflecting off a mirror. Now I totally get that you might have your misgivings with the notion that light has momentum, but like I said, let's just assume that this is true. In this case, light reflecting off a mirror is actually a very similar situation to our ball. And just like our ball, reflecting light pushes on a mirror as it is reflected. 
its direction is changing. So its momentum is changing, and momentum is conserved, so it has to give the momentum difference to the mirror. By shining a flashlight on a mirror, you are literally pushing it. But this doesn't just happen with mirrors, it also happens with lenses. If I shine light through a lens, its path is bent. To be concrete, let's say I have a lens, and I only shine light through the rightmost part of it. All this light is then bent to the left. That means the light has to push the lens to the right. This lens is literally pushed to the right by bending light to the left. Of course, if I only imagine illuminating the left side of the lens, then light is being bent to the right, and thus the lens is pushed to the left. Now, if I imagine illuminating this lens completely uniformly, so that there's exactly as much light passing through the left as through the right, then these two forces oppose each other, and they cancel. The net force on the lens with even illumination is zero. However, let's imagine I illuminate it unevenly. Let's imagine the light passing through the right side is brighter than the left. What happens then? Well, there's still a force to the right and left, but the force to the right is now stronger. The net force is now to the right, and the lens will be pushed to the right. So here we are, the big points. Are you ready for it? Let's imagine I illuminate a lens with a laser beam whose intensity is very strong in the center of the beam, but gets weaker outside the center. Again, if the lens is perfectly in the middle of the laser beam, there is equal light going through both sides, and the net force on it is zero. But what happens if the lens then leaves the center? It is now unevenly illuminated, but as we see, this uneven illumination always acts to push it back into the beam. The lens is stuck. If it's in the center of the beam, it's fine, but if it moves out of the center, it gets pushed back in. It's held in place by light. Of course, this only works to push the lens left or right. There's nothing stopping it from moving front to back. However, instead of a lens, if we imagine just like a glass sphere, and we imagine a laser beam that is actually focused at a spot such that its intensity varies in the front back direction, we see we can use this trick again to hold it in the front back direction. And that's really the whole idea behind optical tweezers, in the abstract at least. In this sort of perfect ideal case I painted, you might think you can only use this to push around tiny glass spheres. Well, that's partially true, but if you have something like a DNA molecule, or a biological cell, or like the flagella of a bacteria, you can chemically bind these things to a microbead and push it around wherever you want. And bam, Nobel Prize. Now for copyright reasons, I'm not going to show a video here of optical tweezers in action, but I would highly recommend you Google it, because there are some very cool videos out there. And that's basically how they work. Hopefully that makes sense. Now you may have more general burning questions about light and its momentum, like how can light even have momentum? Or maybe you noticed that I cheated in my discussion at the beginning of this video when I said that the ball must lose speed by reflecting, and yet that light was just like the ball. This is obviously an issue because light, which isn't a ball, must always go the same speed. So how does that work? Or why don't we notice this push of light in everyday life? Well, like I said, hold on to those questions. I hope to tackle them in a future video, but until then, have a good one. This video, and all Atoms and Sparks videos, are sort of a condensed discussion on a set of blog posts from the Atoms and Sparks blog. If you want to find out more detail about the stuff that was discussed here, the corresponding blog post is linked below. Also, check the blog to vote on new episode topics and see some discussion on other topics.